Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Healthy Curiosity. I have a really special gift for you today, really. You can consider it a free masterclass or maybe a lengthy public service announcement from the world of Chinese medicine. I'm going to be answering one of the most common questions that I get asked all the time by patients who want to take better care of themselves, and that is, what is dampness? There are two diagnoses that I make with almost everyone that comes into the clinic. Pretty much everyone is dealing with stress, which in Chinese medicine we translate as liver chi stagnation. Basically anything that makes you tense up is going to sort of alter the free flow of chi in the body. And that's generally pretty easy to understand. Dampness can be a bit more complicated, but it is so worth understanding. When you get this concept, your life can change. If you are dealing with tiredness, lethargy, poor digestion like gas or bloating or loose stool, sticky stool, brain fog, congestion, postnasal drip, if you can't seem to lose weight even though you think you're doing everything right, you're going to want to listen up if you have those things and more. Maybe even grab a pen and paper to take some notes because this is going to be really info packed. But first, assuming that you're not driving, this could be interesting. If you want to go to a mirror and stick out your tongue, I'll just keep talking while you do this. Check out your tongue. If you just stick it out really big so you can see the whole thing, do you notice a coat? The tongue should have a thin coat on it that is thin enough that you can still see the color of the tongue body underneath it. If the coat is thicker, that is a sure sign of dampness. Same deal if it is swollen or if it has little teeth marks on the edges, kind of a scalloping effect. This is because the tongue is a bit swollen, harboring a bit more fluid than the body knows what to do with. And those are part of the way that we tell that there's dampness. The other is, of course, with symptoms and with slipperiness in the pulse. So dampness generally arises from when we commit dietary indiscretions. The spleen and stomach are the captains of the digestive team, and they're responsible for transforming our food into usable nutrition. And when they are struggling to do that, what results is a kind of residue or a fog in the body, turbidity, excess moisture that the body doesn't quite know what to do with. And like a fog inside our bodies, dampness can make us feel bogged down, heavy, cloudy, both on a mental and physical level. It's often carried around as extra weight. It can seep out. It can seep out anywhere, really. It's kind of yucky. So like nasal discharge or post-nasal drip. Snoring can be a sign of hidden dampness. Water retention or swelling can be a sign that you've got dampness. Probably the most common sign is in the digestive system. People that experience bloating and gas If your poop tends to be loose or sticky or contains any mucus, you more than likely have dampness that's obstructing the spleen and stomach's ability to digest and transform your food and get it to get those nutrients to where they need to go in the body. Similarly, if you find that you often have a low appetite or aren't really in tune with what you want to eat, that can be a sign that dampness is stifling your digestive fire. Dampness being a heavy yin substance often sinks in the body and shows up as things like vaginal discharge or frequent yeast infections, ovarian cysts, turbidity in the bladder, which could show up as cloudy urine, or even lower down in the body like athlete's foot or toenail fungus. Dampness can combine with heat to produce things like acne or just skin outbreaks. Eczema can be damp. Also things like gallstones or gout. Here in Oregon, I see plenty of patients who have arthritis that gets worse in the cold, damp winter. And that's a sign that it's not just chi stagnation in the channels, there's a damp aspect to this arthritis. Or for others that experience flare-ups in the hot and humid weather of the summer, this is damp heat obstructing the channels. So 
what all these things have in common is that there's this element of excess yuck that the body doesn't quite know what to do with and is having difficulty transforming. It weighs us down. It makes us feel tired, lethargic, maybe even depressed. And a lot of people assume that when they're tired, that they're deficient, which is a totally reasonable thing to assume, right? That if you're tired, that like, oh, what what can I take that can help me feel more energized? And so people often ask me about things like ginseng or ashwagandha, like adaptogenic herbs that help us deal with stress and obviously reasonable assumptions since most people are also stressed. But if we think about what's going to be more effective, like to prop ourselves up with tonics versus resolving this excess that we're carrying around all the time, if you think about perhaps going on a long hike with a really heavy backpack, it's going to be way easier for you to feel energized and to be able to walk a lot further if you can take that heavy backpack off rather than pounding an energy drink or some coffee. So this is what we're going to focus on today is basically where, what causes dampness and how we can get rid of it. A related concept in Chinese medicine is phlegm. And this is with a capital P. So it's not just the phlegm that we, that we can see in our lungs or that, you know, that we're coughing up or spitting out or blowing out, but also this idea of insubstantial phlegm that can show up as phlegm misting the mind, which distorts our perception of the world, like bugs on the windshield. Phlegm also can give us brain fog or cloudy thinking. It can lead to insomnia. It's actually a really common cause of insomnia. And when phlegm combines with wind, we get things like seizures or even stroke. It says in the classics that strange diseases are caused by phlegm and that there is no place that phlegm cannot reach. Super ominous, right? Phlegm, it can also show up as like weirdness, like a fatty cyst or a skin tag or a benign tumor of some kind, a phlegm nodulation. It can also show up as like excess cholesterol or crud in the blood, plaque in the arteries. So these are related concepts that essentially dampness that's, that combines with heat, the moisture evaporates, you get these kind of nodulations, it, it, it gets more sticky and often more difficult to get rid of. So where does it come from? You might wonder. Well, you can probably guess that in a standard American diet, it comes from too much. Too much what? Well, too much everything almost, Um, especially too much sugar, too much greasy fried stuff, too much cold beverages, especially beer, but also iced water and juices and artificial anything and eating at the wrong times and just plain eat overeating. So to unpack some of this, a lot of times if we think about like that everything in our digestive system has to heat up everything that we're putting into soup and then pass it on, like the stomach has to create hundred degree soup out of your food. And so you can think about it as like your digestive fire, it needs to be kindled. It, It can't handle things that are too wet, too cold, or too heavy. It needs to be kindled. So if you wake up in the morning and it's like you've got this campfire that's been burning overnight, throwing a bunch of wet leaves on your tiny little campfire, which would be things like milk and cereal or a cold green smoothie with highly processed protein powder added, that's going to be really hard to process. Your your little smoldering digestive fire is going to be put out by that. Similarly, it's not a great idea to have like a giant slab of steak for breakfast because that would be like throwing a giant redwood tree on your little campfire. Maybe there's some excellent nutrition, some good fuel in there, but if your digestive fire is not strong enough to hack into it at that time of day, you're not really going to be able to make use of it. Your best bet for breakfast is going to be warm and cooked. So think like a porridge, a hot cereal, a congee, oatmeal with chia seeds and cinnamon and cardamom, or a leftovers from dinner that could be a little quinoa with a stir fry and some protein. Think outside the breakfast box. And if you're not hungry, it's a great idea to start your day with some fresh ginger tea. This will stimulate digestive fire and ready the body to be digesting some food. Also, not a great idea to eat if you're not hungry. And while we're talking about the timing of eating, 
It's also a great idea to eat your largest meal in the day when the digestive fire is strong. So in the middle of the day, not at dinner time either, because at dinner time, digestive fire is waning and you don't need a whole huge meal with lots of calories right before you go to bed. Great idea to leave at least three hours between your last meal and going to sleep for optimal digestion. So eating before it gets dark, ideally before seven, making sure that every time you eat that you're doing so in a relaxed way and that you are slowing down enough to be in a parasympathetic state, right? You want to be in rest and digest mode and not fight or flight when you're eating food. Otherwise, you're not going to digest very well. And this may sound super obvious, but chewing your food, right? Chewing digestion begins in the mouth. The stomach does not have teeth. And when we chew, this we allow the stomach to get ready because we're releasing digestive enzymes. It also activates the yang energy of the kidneys, which is like the pilot light on the stove. And so if the spleen is this digestive fire and the stomach is the it's the cook pot that is receiving the food, the kidney is like the pilot light. And all of these things need to be in good working order in order for us to digest well. Super important to, at the time of meals, to be, not be flooding the digestive system with excess liquids. So not a great idea to be having tons of liquid. You can have ideally about like a third of your stomach will be empty at mealtime to leave space for digestion, a third liquid and a third food. And this will allow everything to combine well. And that liquid that you're eating with your meals should be room temperature or warmer. So think room temperature water, water without ice, or tea. A lot of teas, especially herbal teas, will have digestive spices in them. Um, Green tea, also great for helping to transform dampness. So having room temperature or warmer liquids with meals. Also, eating meals as opposed to grazing. If you are constantly snacking on something or eating every few hours, your spleen and stomach never really get to take a break. So their energy is going to be taxed. I'm sure you've also heard the advice to eat in a mindful way and not be multitasking while eating. And in Chinese medicine, this is like, if you're taking in information, it's the spleen and stomach that process information that, uh, so studying while eating is a really bad idea because you're trying to digest things on two levels at once. Plus, if you're, if you're reading something like the news, it's easy to be tense and and that's not going to be great for digestion either. So, um, so a great tip is before you sit down to eat, getting into a relaxed state, taking a few breaths, maybe practicing gratitude for what you're about to receive, maybe even doing some self-massage, placing your hands on your abdomen and doing little circles in the direction of digestion. So like up on the right, over and across, down on the left, just bringing some, some heat and some movement. Great to do after meals too, to help the energy go to the spleen and stomach, the digestive system, and to help things move through in a gentle way. So that's like a little qigong self-massage tip. In terms of what we're actually putting into our bodies, right? So we've we've got just a couple of like, this is not going to be a list of long, complicated rules. A lot of them are really common sense. So first of all, no ice water. If you think about respecting digestive fire, nothing dripping in grease. (laughs) So fried foods, French fries, potato chips, but also fatty meats like pork that just are are swimming in fat are going to be hard to break down. Sugar and dairy are probably the other biggest, most important things to avoid. Sugar for obvious reasons, right? It's We're running 10,000 times more sugar through our systems than our ancestors did even a few hundred years ago. It's just way too much for the pancreas to handle. Pancreas is part of the spleen stomach system in Chinese medicine. We don't want to set ourselves up for diabetes or metabolic syndrome. So just limiting the sugar intake, also sugar is the taste that goes with the spleen and too much of it will weaken the spleen. Dairy products, dairy is mucogenic and it is like increases like. So anything that is sticky and cloudy and heavy is going to create more of that in the body. So that goes for dairy products. The exceptions to that will be like a little butter is fine. Generally speaking on the spectrum of dairy that is to be avoided versus dairy that you can get away with a little bit of, a little bit of yogurt is often okay. And a little bit of goat cheese because goats eat a a more diverse diet than cows are fed. So you also want to limit the fake dairy, the gums and the stabilizers that are in things like almond milk or soy milk, which is again, processed with hexanes, like things you really don't need in your system. These, these stabilizers and gums 
can harbor biofilms. And the biofilms, by the way, are are kind of like the plaque on your teeth that are, are hard to get off, but they exist in our digestive system and they actually comprise that that polymicrobial film on your tongue is from your digestive tract. It literally is crawling up your digestive tract and see you're being able to see more of it on your tongue means that you have dampness. It's like that stuff is hard to get rid of. And so either making your own oat milk or cashew milk or almond milk or whatever it is you're doing can be one way to do it because then you know that you're not getting the stabilizers and and artificial crud that's in there. And also things like carrageenan, which can be inflammatory to the gut. So limit the dairy, think outside the dairy box and limit the sugar. Also limit things that the body doesn't know what to do with, which is going to be anything artificial, artificial colors and flavors and sweeteners. The body's going to go, huh, what do I do with this? I know I'll just store it here as, as this, like, we'll just put it in this closet. And then what happens when the closet overflows? Well, things go awry. Foods that are already sweet, like a piece of fruit are fine in moderation, but I would avoid juices if you're dealing with damp. Because like, if you were living a few hundred years ago, it might be that you would have fruit in season in the summer or like when it, when it ripens and then it would be gone. It wouldn't be something that was available to you year round. And you would likely be having it in its whole form, which comes with the fiber that tempers the blood sugar spikiness of the sugar. And generally speaking, sweet and sour together, that taste creates fluid in the body, which is great if you're dealing with a dry condition that needs moistening. But if you're dealing with already like too much moisture, especially pathological moisture, as dampness is, you're not going to want to be slamming down the nutritive essence of a dozen pieces of fruit first thing in the morning, like orange juice, right? Without any of the fiber to buffer. And it's basically just going to tax your spleen, your digestive system. Also, what people don't think of as fruit juice, but really kind of is, is tomato sauce, right? Tomatoes are a fruit. It's cold. It's watery. It's pretty damp. So having tomato sauce in everything can be bogging down for the spleen. Also, sugars can hang out in plenty of things that you think are healthy, like yogurt or granola or sauces or dressings. It's a great idea if you're avoiding dampness to really opt out of the processed foods and if you're going to have something like granola, make it yourself so that you know how much sweetener is getting into your diet. Also, things like nuts and seeds, like these are healthy foods, but if, you, if you've if you got weak digestion, it can be hard to hack into that. Nuts and seeds, I think, are generally fine in moderation, even if you are dealing with dampness, but an exception would be peanuts. They're grown underground and they typically harbor fungus. So if they are harboring fungus, you are going to be harboring fungus. They're going to increase the fungal terrain or dampness in the body. Also, alcohol like beer tends to be really hard or or kombucha for that matter, like yeast and sugar that is served cold is not going to be awesome for the spleen. Now within that, of course, if you're having something that is made with honey or that is that where that's like super fermented so that all the sugar gets, gets, pre-digested, that's going to be a better choice. But in general, you're going to want to eat warm, cooked food, avoid the sugar, and prepare your food pretty freshly, like food that is five days old, that is going to be perhaps harboring some bacteria, is also going to be potentially dampening for the digestive system. Other causes of dampness that don't come from food are Undigested emotions, especially things like guilt and shame, those can hang out in the body as dampness. And dampness can also enter the body directly from things like sleeping on damp ground or wearing a damp bathing suit for hours, right? That can lead to um, to damp conditions. So anyway, that was a lot, but hopefully it makes sense in the sense that that you don't want to be having dense, cold, wet, heavy stuff you don't want to be eating all the time and you don't want to be eating things the body doesn't recognize. I'm not going to give you a massive list of things to treat dampness because in general, well, there can be variations on the theme, whether your dampness is combined with cold or combined with heat, whether it has taxed your digestive system or whether it's hanging out in another system of the body. This is where a Chinese herbalist is going to be able to help you. But I will say, I will give you a few guidelines of things to include. So one is just like, just keep it simple. Eat warm food that is cooked and generally speaking, simple. 
spices in general are going to be great for transforming dampness, especially these like the master dampness transformers. I consider fresh ginger and black pepper. Fresh ginger, you can like hack off a few slices of ginger fresh, steep it in some water, ideally with a cover on it for five to seven minutes, and then drink it. And black pepper, wonderful to kindle digestive fire, really easy to add to almost anything. Also cardamom, really, uh, it's really specific kitchen spice that transforms dampness. Also other cooking spices like rosemary, basil, thyme, sage, dill, parsley, and coriander. A lot of our digestive spices or a lot of our spices are exist to flavor our food, but also to help us digest it. So again, if you're cooking, it's going to be really easy to get these things into your life. Things that, that generally grow in water and that can make use of water can be helpful in transforming dampness. So this would include things like wild rice, barley, amaranth, millet, and rye. Also legumes like aduki beans, mung beans, and lentils. Bitter foods can transform dampness. This would include stuff like your mixed greens that are bitter, like uh, chicory, escarole, endive, radicchio, and even romaine and watercress, things that are um, have a bit of that bitter taste that transforms dampness. Also things like radishes and burdock and seaweed. Seaweed is actually really good for phlegm. That salty taste can transform phlegm nodulations. So again, it's not about adding all of these things. It's about subtracting the things that for you are the most dampening. So think about your life. Like just what would be the, the one step you could take to make your diet less damp? Maybe it's cutting out ice water. Maybe it's decreasing beer. Maybe it is not eating between meals. Maybe it is making an effort to cook more food from scratch and to not overload your system with chips. So pick something and just make that one little change and your life will be less damp for it. If this information was useful to you and you want more of it and you want to apply more Chinese medicine to your life, you can check out my basics of Chinese medicine course at brodywelch.com. That's brody with an IE and welch with a CH. If you're wanting to go beyond the theory and want support and actually taking action in applying Chinese medicine teachings and Ayurvedic teachings to your life, you can look for the Level Up Your Life course at brodywelch.com or apply to work with me one-on-one. For more information in written form, you can check out Bob Flaza's Tao of Healthy Eating. He makes that, that analogy of the campfire really clear and Ellen Goldsmith's Nutritional Healing with Chinese Medicine. She's been a guest on the show multiple times. So you can look for other episodes of this podcast for her as a guest. And If you appreciated this episode and know somebody who you think could benefit, I'd love for you to tell a friend or two about the podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Your attention is a valuable commodity and I respect it. What you pay attention to is where your energy goes. And I hope it's going to things that help you feel energized and alive and that don't weigh you down and make you feel damp. Thanks for listening today. To check out the show notes, get on my email list or drop me a line, head to brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. I'd love to hear from you. If you learned something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. Till next time, be good to yourself.